Who are some of the artists, if any, that have influenced your work? Oh, there's a list of artists. Well, uh, Quilter-wise, like I'll have to give Susan Shine credit because uh, earlier on I had Another really, soccer member. <laughs> <laughs> I really rem uh, was impressed and she was like a role model with her surface design and her narrative quilts. I really liked that. It was a great deal. But uh, I started off as a visual painter, so I'd have to give uh, Picasso, Matisse for their color and abstract design. And then also Romare Bearden for collage, uh, because I went from collage to applique, from paper to fabric. And so I did that. And then Jacob Lawrence for color as well. And then Frida Carlo for her narrative. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, I really liked her a lot. And um, let's see, and also when music has been a great influence in me working, I always have music going on in the background. I'm very eclectic in my choice of music, but I have to give Bob Dylan credit because of his story. Really? I, I was a teenager when I got into Bob Dylan. My mother said, what is all that noise? Uh, <laughs> but uh, Bob Dylan's storytelling is just amazing. And so uh, storytelling, the, uh, I do storytelling through the narrative quilts, but I think growing up in L.A. and looking at a lot of reruns on TV, uh, old Hollywood movies, and then uh, songs and stories, uh, that all kind of really got embedded into me where I wanted to tell stories through my artwork. And also history, you know, but mm -hmm. different personalities. Mm -hmm. Why do you think quilts are important? Well, they're part of history, both not only for the country, but for family. It's a legacy. Somebody's created it, and they created it with love and passion. And I'm, I'm sure they, didn't, they generally in families, it was passed on to grandchildren or their own siblings or something like that. So it's something to hold on to because it's a memory, and it's a person that was constructed by hands. And so it's very special. Uh, it's art, but it's also like a legacy. So uh, that's why I think it's very important. Uh, for the country, it's very important because it was a lifesaver for early America, uh, for families moving across country, for pioneers, for slaves on plantations. Uh, that kept them warm in the wintertime. And so it has a very special place in American history as well as in international history. There are many quilters in the audience uh, that are professional quilters or quilters that aspire to be professional quilters. Do you have any words of advice for these quilters uh, on their journey? Just keep doing oh. it. Just keep doing it. Um, no, the, the more you do it, the more you learn, you know, different techniques. You kind of learn about yourself. Um, hopefully you expand and explore uh, and don't limit yourself, you know, kind of work out the box. You know, that's what I would say. Do you remember your first quilt show? The first show you were ever in? Let's see, you have to out. <laughs> 40 years ago, first quilt show, hmm. I, it might have been something uh, in a community center, I think, maybe not even in the city, maybe in Connecticut. I think there was a community center in Hartford, Connecticut that I was in a show, and I think I had a couple of pieces in that show. I, there was a vague memory of that. I remember that. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> That's how I met Ed, Ed oh, Janetta right. Miller, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. and right. Jonathan. Okay. All yeah. Right. All right. So that was my first quilt cool show back then. Okay, okay. Um, also, have in, in, in your quilting, has it afforded you travel? Have you traveled with any of the shows that you've been in a multitude of shows around the world? Well, uh, uh, I have been to a few shows. Most people assume that the 
quilter goes with the show and, and with the quilt, but I tell people, no, I don't get invited. You know, just the quilt goes. I ask. I, the reason I ask is because so many people here today have come up to me and said, I've never seen him before. Is that really Michael Cummings? So this is why I asked. Yeah, uh, a few occasions I have uh, volunteered to, to go to a show, but one of the big times that I had an exciting time was I got invited to go have a show in Japan. So round trip ticket, and they shipped all my work. And I was there for 10 days in Yokohama. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a wonderful, it was an annual quilt convention right. show. Yeah. And uh, basically uh, Japanese quilters, but they invited uh, outsiders. So they had, I think it was three or four of us from different right. countries yeah. that were there. And that was very exciting. And a few times in other places in the United States. I, at Bates College, I was up at Bates College and they invited me over there and uh, I showed there. Is there a favorite exhibition? Hmm, let's see. You better favorite. say Spirits of the Court. <laughs> <laughs> well, one that I've attended maybe. <laughs> Bates College had a good one for me because they had just uh, completed the gallery, a new gallery, so it was a brand new space, nice lighting, wall space and all like that, yeah. Great, great. Yeah. Have you, um, noticed within the quilt community any quilters, young quilters or new quilters whose work you find exciting and different and uh, uh, that says something? No, I, I do look at quilt magazines or publications and uh, but I can't really name anyone. Mm, okay. Can you? <laughs> You. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I'm, um, right now, I'm going to uh, open this up to questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Questions for Michael? Anyone? I'm going to borrow one of your mics. Oh, okay. Hi, Mr. Cummings, do you have in your head a quilt that you haven't quite, that you haven't made yet? Like, is there something that you must make before you hang up all of your, your sewing machine, <laughs> shut it well, down? Well, I won't say it's on my bucket list, but I do have a, an idea that I'd like to do a series of quilts of my experience growing up in Los Angeles, uh, going to the beach, going to the park, just the whole outdoor living, and also winter in Los Angeles, too. I remember growing up, uh, my father would bring home a different colored Christmas tree every year uh, uh, because out there they spray paint them and uh, we had pink, blue, yellow, red and my mother had to stop him bringing them in because I was asthmatic and they used car paint on the trees and so it's very toxic so but I do want to do a series on growing up in Los Angeles. Mm. Um, hi, since you've been quilting for 40 years, you say, have yes. you ever looked at some of your earlier quilts and thought, I need to rework them, or when they're finished, are they just completely finished and you never go back to them? I never go back to them, uh, because I'm not in the same mindset any longer, and uh, if I start something, it would kind of be a boomerang thing and make something else not look right, so I don't try to go back. Mr. Oh, oh. Oh, as quilters, well, many of us have what I call quilt ghosts with unfinished quilts that we just fall out of love with and we never finish. Do you have any such quilts? Yes, I do. And I, <laughs> and I actually finished one about a month ago that I had around for a couple of years. And I said, well, I, I should bring this to life and finish it. So I, I did that. Yeah, so I do have some ghost quilts, you call them? I'm glad to know there's <laughs> Okay, all right. Mr. Cummings, I love how you called your sewing machine your dance partner. Have you kept the same dance partner for many years, or do you change out your dance partner every so often? No, I have the same dance partner that I've had for 40 years. Uh, 
I, I, I have tried, I thought about replacing the dance partner, but I, I, there's no problem, so I, I keep the dance partner. And it does a basic straight stitch and a zigzag stitch. And uh, it, it's a domestic table model that I got from Macy's. They don't sell them anymore, and uh, it's held up. It's very good, and so it knows my moves, and I know its moves. <laughs> And everything you see, all these large quilts, goes through that small sewing machine. Yeah. I have a picture of you. I believe it's with when Mark Stewart interviewed you. Mm -hmm. and among those pictures was a picture of you at the sewing machine, and that was the first time I saw that little tiny machine. And I thought, well, oh, my goodness, right. these quilts are so huge. How can you do it with that tiny machine? Right, right. So people have tried to tell me in the early beginning I should get, what, an industrial sewing machine? And uh, I didn't feel I needed that, so uh, I stuck with my dance partner. Yeah. 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 Yes, Mr. Mr. Cummings, um, do you ever collaborate with other quilters? Um, no, I haven't. I, I, I've created... Uh, commission work, and I worked with architects, uh, but not um, quilters. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, I, I think I get that from being, coming from a visual artist background and having a frame or a mat around the artwork. So therefore, uh, it's essential for me to have a border. And so, some type of border, either a patchwork border or just uh, fabric. And I'm also using binding on the border now, too. I like that extra little touch of color. So, it's, it's, it's a requirement for me. Okay. If I could please address your question as someone who's also got the day job and am the daughter of an artist and kind of had to struggle how to confine the muses to not later than midnight and waiting till the weekend. So within those parameters, have you discovered certain tricks of how to keep, since, since I thought I heard you mention you don't particularly draw, I kind of don't either, I just work directly to the design wall. Do you have particular tricks as to sort of balance between, I, I want to say controlling the muses, and that's not the right word, maybe right. containing them until your free time allows? Well, that's been a challenge from day one because I had a nine to five job, I had just bought a house that was being renovated, and I wanted to quilt. So the time was very important. I had to budget that. And so that's where the personal trainer came in, in terms I could really understand how much time I was spending per hour on my work. And then I had to budget my time per evening coming home from work. And so on the average, when I was working, I was putting in maybe 28, 30 hours a week because I was spending from like uh, 7 to 8, 9, 10, almost 11 o'clock working on a quilt if I had a deadline for that quilt to be finished. And so um, it, it was a lot of discipline that had to take effect. And in the summertime, looking out the window at the sun and people out walking and doing things, and I'm in the house and say, well, Michael, what are you doing? Are you crazy? And then I have to realize, well, this is what I wanted to do. So accept it and enjoy it. So, uh, yeah. But, but balancing your time, with, and for me, it was very important. Yeah. Michael, you have large collections of art as well as quilts. Just collections, period, of lots of stuff. Yeah, I'm kind of impulsive. <laughs> yes, yes, this is why I'm asking this question. Um, have you made provisions for, for those collections? 
I'm starting to think about it and discuss it and go to seminars about it because uh, I'm not alone in this sort of situation. I went to um, a seminar a few years ago downtown at NYU whereby they invited senior artists to come and they had a lawyer, a gallery, and other people representing talking about what's going to happen to your artwork, your archives. And so they planted a lot of ideas of possibilities uh, in our minds, the, in the attendance there. So I'm starting to work on that seriously because I know it's a problem and um, I do have a lot of artwork, my own and other people's, and so I have to start really deciding how to distribute our pass that around. Right. This is a question that I deal with every day uh, with the Women of Color Quilters Network and my own collection. Mm -hmm. So I'm always asking yeah. about collections and if provisions have been made for those collections. And I think it's important for us as artists. We're creating work constantly and one of the things we have to think about is the afterlife but of also, those collections. Uh, during that course of going to the seminar mm -hmm. and meeting some other groups, archiving your work as well. And so I've started to use some uh, programs, applications in my computer, whereby I uh, download a photograph and a sort of an outline of what the work is about in terms of the date, age, size and different things like that. So it's a printout that I could use or anyone else could use to see what I have in my collection. You want to elaborate a little bit more about that and, and talk about the software? I, I don't know the name important. of the software. Somebody passed it on <laughs> to me, but it was free. I know that. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, perhaps you could just Google or something to, to find out about it. Yeah, it's very important that we inventory everything that we, we have, everything right. that we make. You right. have to keep documentation and an inventory of right. it, so that's, right. that's good. Yeah, that's good that's very to know. important. I, I have to say also in, in working with you, Michael was the first male quilter, and right now we still have only five in the Women of Color Quilters Network. And I, think, I, mean, and I, I honestly think now, now it's about time to change the name after 30 years <laughs> to, to include the five men that have been in the network. Really, it's time to change the name. Sorry. I, I remember those early years and the, the debate about should we keep the name, change the name, and uh, it remained the same. Right. But I got accepted. It, well, you know we love you, so uh, yeah. So we, I'm going to change the name. Okay, it'll, it'll, okay. it'll be it'll be reflective. Okay. So, are there any other questions? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll consider it now. And I'll <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. I was asking about the time. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Okay, generally, it has taken me about two months. I give myself two months to complete a top. And um, I take it out, look at it, work on it, put it back. And then, like I said, improvisation, sometimes spontaneity kicks in. And I might see something that I want to put on it that I hadn't thought about before. And then embellishments, they come along in you know, different objects I might want to put. I've been using a lot of three-dimensional objects recently. But the bottom line is I give myself about two months to complete a quilt. On my website, because I don't 
possess them any longer, all 12 of them. Uh, I mentioned one was at City College here in New York at the Music Library. Uh, one's at Michigan State University Art Museum. Um, and then there's in books, a variety of books that I have some in. With website, you could see all 12 of them and the image enlarges as you click on it. What's your website? Uh, MichaelCummings.com. Also, also, Michael was interviewed by the Smithsonian. Right, for okay. oral history. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a complete long oral history is on the Smithsonian Institution's website uh, where we were interviewed, I mean, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Oh. I, time goes fast, okay. so fast. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, okay. right. Well, he, he also has a quilt in the collection of the Smithsonian's American Museum of Art, as well as this oral history in the American Museum of Art's uh, archives, oral history archives. And that's accessible online. Okay. So anyone that wants to hear that can um, freely access it online. We've got two more questions. Michael, th thank you so much for being here today and sharing your work with us. Um, you talked about how your process is one of visualization to cloth. How do you know when you're done? Like I said, the quilt tells me. <laughs> uh, I, I just work and work and work and then I step back and if I feel I can't put one more piece of fabric on there, I stop. Uh, and it, it, I've, I've kind of reached that conclusion very easily now. I've been doing it for so long, I just kind of know when I should stop and I can't go any further. But I, I say the quilt tells me. One more question? And thank you again for being here. Along those same lines, your work seems to have a very clear style and voice now, but did you always have that from the beginning or how long did it take you to develop that? Because I'm a fairly new quilter and feel like I'm still looking for what my true style and voice right. is in my quilting. It was an evolution. I mean, coming from a painting background, I started off with still lives, you know, and flowers and fruits and different other objects. And then I kind of went on to explore the possibility of using form in my artwork. And that grew. And then I got into storytelling. And then now I'm actually even writing words onto the surface of the quilts. So, and then it depends on what direction you want to go in in terms of, I kind of swayed over to African American history and pulled out celebrities and events to put into my quilts. And so, the, but it's a gradual process. You know, you have to feel comfortable about it. I was very comfortable doing still lifes for a long time, looking at Matisse and the colors and his uh, compositions. But I gradually started to get more into more storytelling, working with Carolyn and the exhibits that she produced and the themes that we had to work with that really expanded my imagination and compositions. Well, I want to thank Michael for coming to the You're welcome. Thank you both. That was incredible. And I want to remind everyone that this interview will be archived in the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. QSOS is the only uh, oral history collection of its kind about quilt makers archived at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. And uh, thank you so much. What a good job interviewing, too. Thank you.